Morning, everyone. <clears throat> this is the battle for the mind, part two. Excuse me. Will I get myself mic'd up once again? I'm out of practice on these Sunday mornings, I'll tell you what. All right, so battle for the mind, part two. I draw your attention to the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. We found ourselves here last week and uh, we discovered some interesting things. And I don't know if you might feel like this sometimes, but doesn't life just feel like a battle? I think that's something we probably all feel every now and again. And don't think you're the only one uh, that has this belief, because God actually declares in his word that life can be a battle. In fact, the Bible shows us that there are three common enemies in our lives. And these are adversaries that constantly slap us with things that we all battle with. These enemies want to defeat you. They want to destroy your family. They want to tear everything down that you have ever cared about. They want to keep you from experiencing peace, joy, and contentment in your life. And make no mistake, these enemies can mess things up for you through their attacks. Now, the Bible even goes so far as to name these enemies. Uh, so that we are not ignorant or standing completely in the dark. They are the world, the devil, and the flesh. The world's attacks surround us. The devil's attacks are constantly in front of us. And the flesh brings to bear the battle within us all. Last week, we started to talk about the greatest of these enemies. And contrary to popular belief, uh, Satan and the world is not the big problem here. In fact, the biggest problem is you. And that is because the greatest battles in life are the ones that you fight within you. Okay? Remember the Apostle Paul talked about the war within us all in the book of 2 Corinthians. And he identifies this as a battle for the mind. Now, in way of quick review, let's again recount uh, this together. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, let's begin our reading in verse number 3. Here Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In other words, the fight that we are in is not a physical one. You know what it is? It's a mental one. Okay? And get this, because the battle is being fought within our very minds, conventional strategy and weapons of war don't really work. They don't apply in this case. But that doesn't mean that we don't have a spiritual strategy or that we are not effectively armed by God for this fight. Verse number four. For weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are not physical weapons that we take up in the flesh, but they are mighty the scriptures declare, through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. You see, God does equip us for the battle that is going on in our heads. And by his power, we are able to pull down the mental blocks and overcome every barrier in our minds. Verse number five, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, in this, God reveals the true nature of the fight. And the very real challenge that is set before us all is a battle for the mind, isn't it? It's a struggle to take captive every thought and bring them under submission so that we are able to take control of our own thoughts and thinking so that we can effectively live and follow Christ. Mm. Brethren, we're talking about a mental struggle here a fight and a battle that is going on within ourselves, and it's incredibly important that we come to terms with this for our own mental health. I wish I had someone have this conversation with me years ago. Now, if you were here last week, you might recall how we used what God teaches us here in this text to discuss three keys of mental health. We talked about three things uh, that we identified as basic truths that we all need to know and understand. That is, if we're ever going to successfully engage in the battle in the mind. The first truth is this. We need to know the battle is real. And there is a war going on, people, and it's a war within each and every one of us. It's a war that we are all in. 
Only it's not a war of flesh and blood. It's not a war involving conventional weapons because this is a battle for the mind. And brethren, you are in this fight whether you want to be or not. You can't ignore it and you certainly can't run away from it because the fight and the personal struggle is going on within you. It's going to be with you wherever you go. So you have to deal with it. You have to take up arms and fight because the battle is real. And I tell you this, it's real for me and it's real for you. It's real for us all. That's the first truth. Secondly, we talked about the true nature of this fight and how this battle is fought within. Okay, It's not fought without, it's fought within. Of course, Paul spoke about this reality in Romans chapter 7. And listen to what he says. He says, For I know that in me, inside me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For though the will is present with me, how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Mm. Here Paul is simply talking about the struggle that was going on within himself. And in essence he says, I am baffled and I can't really figure myself out. I'm like a walking contradiction because I want to do certain things and I don't. And the things that I want to completely avoid, well those are the things that I end up doing, even to my own detriment. And that my friends, is a story of us all. We are constantly at war within ourselves and fighting against our own sinful nature. And we have to understand the struggle that is really going on within us because the battle is being fought in our minds. That was the second truth that we learned last week. And perhaps no truth was more revealing than the third we explored together, though. And that is the truth that got us to really look in the mirror, if you'll recall. What we came face to face with was just how destructive our minds can be. You see, the more we lose the battle for the mind within, the more our own self-destruction becomes apparent without. And please remember how it works. Because wrong thinking leads to wrong feelings, and wrong feelings leads us to wrong actions. And when our thinking, feelings, and behaviors are wrong, destruction is certain to follow. This is the very essence of the battle going on within us all. Okay? It's a very real struggle, and it's a battle for the mind. Only at its core, it's not about addressing your feelings or your behaviors, because where the fight really begins is right here. Every outcome in life really all hinges back to this. Our minds is what our feelings and behaviors listen to. And when we begin to lose the battle for the mind, our lives begin to self-destruct. That was the third truth that we learned last week. And it's really this third truth that I want us to again focus on and talk about more today. I want to again emphasize our natural tendency to self-destruct. But what is more than that? I want us to talk about how God really enables us to be free from our own self-destruction. Doesn't that sound good? And brethren, this is the message that we really need to hear because it contains the true secret and essence to our mental health. It's all about coming to terms and taking control for the battle of the mind. Now, in, over to, in order to overcome all the destruction in our lives, the first thing we need to understand is where all this destruction comes from. And I can tell you this, whenever we fail to possess full control over our thoughts and thinking, destruction is on the horizon. And often it doesn't come from any outside source. Know that we really bring this destruction upon ourselves. And this happens far more than it really should. You see, often we ruin our lives because of our very real tendency to self-destruct. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that sometimes we take up weapons and we use them against ourselves in this way because we get so overwhelmed by the battle that is going on within. We don't know how to deal with it. So we do things that cause hurt, stress, pain, anguish, and unhappiness in our lives. Don't figure. And even though we know these things are destructive, we often feel powerless to do anything about it. And have you ever 
stopped to really ask why. Why do we do things that in the long run we know will end up hurting us? Well, there's only one explanation as far as I can see it to explain this. And that is because we are not thinking clearly. It's because we are losing ground on this all-important battle for our minds. Interestingly, most psychologists tend to agree that when it comes to our own self-destructive behaviors, most of us struggle with the same things. Okay? In fact, the general consensus among professionals is that there are several things that contribute to messing up people's lives more than anything else. And together, we talked about seven of those things last week. And we identified them as being weapons that contribute to our own self-destruction. And the first thing we talked about was shame. Remember this? You cannot be happy and ashamed at the same time. When all you constantly feel is guilt, regret, and shame over the past, it makes it impossible to move on and really enjoy the present. Shame becomes a mental wall and a barrier, a stronghold of sorts, that will adversely affect the way that you live. That's the number one destroyer of happiness. It's shame. Next, we talked about the weapon that we pick up and level against ourselves, and we identified it as being uncontrolled thoughts. If you can't control the way that you think, your life is heading for destruction. And we already talked about the greater cause and effect here, haven't we? Because wrong thinking leads to wrong feelings, and wrong feelings lead to wrong actions. That's how it works. The third weapon we have a tendency to use comes from compulsions. And what I mean by that is the inner drives and the underlying things that compel us to do something. Now, you can call it a lust, you can call it a habit, you can call it an impulse, but these are the things that inevitably drive you. And the problem here is that if all you react to and do in your life involves a compulsion, it will mess your life up. Our fourth destructive tendency is born out of fear. Fear is an enormous destroyer of self-potential. And it inhibits God's purpose for your life. If you can't master your fears, your fears will surely master you. They will paralyze and cripple the way that you live your life. Destructive. Very destructive. We could add to this feelings of hopelessness uh, and, and, and how that, that dissuades and destroys us. We can add to it bitterness. We can add to it personal insecurity. And that makes up the list. All right? All these things are incredibly destructive. The key to overcoming these weapons actually comes from the Word of God. This is the next step you and I need to take in the battle for the mind. We need to see what God has to say. It's not just about knowing that we're in a fight or understanding what we are fighting for. We actually need to know how to fight to succeed, don't we? We need to know how to control our thinking. We need to learn how to be set free from our own self-destructive tendencies. And I can tell you initially, what I wanted to do was work through that entire list of, of these self-destructive weapons that we tend to pick up and use on ourselves. But we just haven't got time to get into all, all that today. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover the first four. Today, we will discover how to overcome our shame, uncontrolled thoughts, compulsions, and fear. They're all very destructive things. And as it turns out, the answers we are also desperately needing are found in Romans chapter 7 and 8. Romans 7 shows us what our self-destruction te destructive tendencies look like and what they do. And, and we, we found ourselves there last week. But Romans 8 actually shows us how to overcome those things. Okay, So let's just pick up our reading now in uh, the back end of Romans chapter 7. Turn with me there. Here Paul concludes everything that we have learned so far. And he talks about this battle in the mind, and he sums it all up rather effectively in verses 24 and 25. Read with me. O oh, wretched man that I am. That means miserable. <laughs> How miserable am I, Paul says. And who shall deliver me from the body of this death? How am I going to get out of this situation? 
I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's just pause there. Notice though the summary that Paul learns from all of his struggles. He says, I'm miserable. All the things I want to do in my life, I don't. And the things I, I don't want to do because they will hurt me. Well, well, that's actually what I end up doing. I now see how I am really messing things up, Paul says, and it's making me miserable. How am I going to get out of this situation? Paul is beginning to come to terms with the fact that he has two natures. Read with me verse, the back end of verse 25. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul says, this is the way it is. My flesh wants and desires to cling to sinful things, but my mind wants to serve and honor Christ. That's the dilemma. And I wonder, can you relate to it? These two natures that are constantly struggling and fighting within us all. Have you ever felt miserable in your life? You might have surfed the web. You might have watched Oprah. You might have been to a Tony Robbins seminar. You might have read a few Dr. Health, uh, Dr. Phil self-help books. But is that the solution to what we're talking about here? Is that going to provide you a turning point in your personal struggle and free you from a life that is dominated by sin? Well, no, it's not. In fact, Paul comes up with the answer here himself because he asks here, who will free me? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death, he proclaims. Notice how he asks who, not what. That's very important. I might now stand miserable in the knowledge of my sin, Paul says, and I might be baffled by my own poor decisions, but I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord because I know he's the solution. That's, that's where Paul concludes uh, chapter number 7. You see, the real answer to this dilemma that you and I face, the battle going on within, the very battle for our minds, the answer to this is not something, but rather someone. Listen carefully now. The answer, the solution to all your problems, it's not a pill, it's not a book, it's not a self-help program or seminar, it's not hypnosis. The answer is not something, it's someone. It's a person, and that person is Jesus Christ and his spirit within you. Now, this is the ultimate conclusion Paul arrives at, chapter number 7. With respect to everything that we've talked about so far, the Bible says here's the answer. It's Jesus Christ in you and the power of his spirit. This is the great answer to all of our negative emotions, to all of those personal struggles, to this very real battle going on within our minds. Romans 8 reveals the solution to us in more detail, explaining this very profound power that is within our grasp and position. So let's see this. We know we have a tendency to self-destruct. We know that. The question we are going to effectively ask today, though, is how can I be free from that? How can I be free from me? <laughs> how can I overcome these weapons of my own self-destruction? And what the scriptures show and teach is that there are actually several mental aptitudes and personal disciplines that we can take up in our minds through the Spirit of God. These mental disciplines will help to make lasting changes in the way you think, and therefore, by wider application, also make lasting changes in the way that you feel and act. Does that sound good? This is the very heart of today's lesson. How can I be free from me? And you know what God's Word tells us? It says that you can through the power of God's Spirit. So let's talk about this first struggle we have, this thing called shame. We need to remember exactly what Jesus has done for us so that we can be free from that shame. We need to remember all that God has given us so that that shame can be lifted. And please understand that when it comes to the battle of the mind, this is not a passive action, okay? 
What I mean by that is it doesn't just happen. It's a mental discipline that you need to create. I have to remind myself every day of what Jesus has done for me and just what he has given me because that's how I'm freed from my shame. And what is salvation? Think about it. What exactly did Jesus do for us on the cross? And even more importantly still, what are the benefits of that great act? Well, we already talked about how shame can lead to our destruction. And and shame, all that shame does is bring these feelings of guilt, regret into the forefront of our focus and attention because of the things we've done in the past. And it's really hard to live in the present when you're stuck way back in the past, okay? Now, there are a lot of saved children of God who act, don't act like they're saved. You know, and what I mean by that is they run around completely miserable, And even though they have the first part of the story down pat, oh, wretched man that I am, that's what Paul said, they somehow feel powerless to move on and really change. They have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal saviour, but they have not been freed from their own self-destructive tendencies. Now notice with me what the Bible says about this. Romans 8 verse number 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So God's word says that we can live a life where we are not under any condemnation. Now, there are two aspects to understanding a verse like this. That is to say, there are two truths that we need to come terms with, with respect to what the Bible actually teaches. The first truth comes from, at the point of salvation. This is when we first receive Christ as our Savior and His Spirit takes up residence within our hearts. Now John chapter 3, Ephesians 1.13 and Ephesians 4.30 actually talk about this. Okay, This is the promise of Christ living in us. Salvation. The second truth the Bible teaches is that after we get saved, we need to learn to live and walk according to Christ's example. And when we do that, we will avoid judgment upon this earth. Now that is something different. That is us living in Christ. Okay? So we have Christ living in us and we have us living in Christ. These are two completely different principles that the Bible teaches. And what I want to do is approach this verse by talking about them both. Verse 1. It says, firstly, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Now, we know that when we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts, the very act of his sacrifice and death on the cross covers us and atones for our sins. Our sins are hidden by the love and grace of Christ Jesus and the blood he shed for us. In fact, Jesus took your condemnation upon himself when he died on the cross. God doesn't have to judge you because Jesus took that judgment for you. Understand that. Your condemnation is not resting firmly upon your shoulders because Jesus took your wrath. He atoned for your sins. He paid the price in full and took this ultimate penalty upon himself. Amen to that. Now the Bible says... That if you're a saved believer, that if you belong to Jesus Christ and his spirit resides within you, then you no longer stand under eternal condemnation. Because Christ in you, you will no longer be judged in that way. That's what the Bible teaches. Jesus, you see, he took your past, present and future sins upon himself and And he forgave those through his sacrifice on the cross. They have been atoned for. They have been bought and paid for. They have been nailed to the cross. And they are now hidden in Christ. And you and I need to appreciate this. Because that truth alone means you don't have to live in shame because of your past. Or bear the overwhelming sense of guilt because of your sin. When Jesus died on the cross, he not only paid for all the sins that you committed last week, last year, and throughout your entire life, but he has already paid for your sins that you're going to commit tomorrow, next week, and for the rest of your life to come. That is how great the sacrifice 
is. That is good news. There is no condemnation because of Christ. And for those of us who have accepted Christ and have his spirit dwelling within. Of course, there is another aspect and part to this verse that we need to talk about. Because nowhere in this verse does it say you will no longer sin. Did you notice that? It doesn't say that you are now completely free from the consequences of sin. It says you're under no eternal condemnation from God. But you know what? Even though we're saved and God's spirit resides within us, we are still sinful creatures. We make mistakes, we do things wrong, and sin has a consequence, okay? Our choices and decisions always have a flow-on effect. That's a fact. Sin will always stand to be judged by a holy and just God. Of course, that doesn't mean you lose your salvation. If you stuff up and get things wrong tomorrow, it doesn't mean that God's going to rip that away from you, his wonderful promise. No, the eternal consequences of our sin in that regard have already been forgiven, remember? You're not under that condemnation because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But that does not mean that our sins in this life will not have an impact upon us. And now we enter in this whole aspect of our own self-destruction, don't we? There is a cause and effect. There is an action, a reaction to every action that we take. And our sins in this life sometimes come back to harm us. We get judged by those actions in this life. So what do we do? How do we avoid sin? How do we avoid this devastating, self-destructive consequence in our own lives? Well, guys, we do what the scriptures say. And again, verse number one shows us. You see, when we are born again, that's not where the story ends. Because we also need to learn to walk again. Notice what verse number one says. There is now. That's that's not speaking of heaven, that's, that's speaking of right now. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That means living in Christ Jesus. That speaks of more than just Christ living in us. Get it? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. When we get saved, the struggle doesn't end. Because the battle continues. And we all need to stop walking in the flesh to begin to walk according to God's spirit. And just as there is no condemnation in an eternal sense, because of the spirit of Christ living within me, neither will there be any condemnation in a physical sense as I learn to live and walk in Christ. Now the Bible teaches that there is no condemnation for those of us that do this. When we get born again, we also need to learn how to walk again. Okay, Not according to the flesh and the old sinful desires of our flesh, but learning to live and walk anew by the Spirit of God within us. This is the secret to overcoming shame in our lives. It comes from knowing that our sins are eternally forgiven in Christ, and that we can be freed from the daily consequences of our sins by learning to live and walk according to the Spirit of Christ within us. And Paul actually talks about this in verse number two. Read it with me. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. See that? In other words, we no longer have to live in our sins because the Spirit of God has freed us from that. And in this, Paul declares that we have a great power in our lives that goes beyond mere willpower alone. That's the Spirit of God. You see, before I became a Christian, and even when I was a Christian, but living by my own fleshly nature, what happens is I start drawing on willpower alone. But 
when we surrender to God's spirit in us, that is no longer the case because we start to tap into a newfound power. Unfortunately, many Christians today still live by willpower alone. Okay, And because they have not yet learned to tap into the spiritual power that Paul is speaking of, they begin to self-destruct. Listen to me now, because your focus, your motivation, your personal drive, they can all be wonderful, useful tools. But your willpower alone will not change your sinful estate and true nature. In fact, the more you come to know and understand who you really are as a sinner, the more you'll fully appreciate how much you need the power of God to change. And here's the good news. God has given us exactly what we need. He has gifted us with his spirit. That is why you and I don't have to walk around in shame. When you're a believer saved by Christ, you have a greater power within you than willpower alone. And that enables you to change. So this is the first key to winning the battle for our minds. It's remembering that you have the power of God within you. You no longer have to live and be enslaved to the flesh. The second key to success in this fight comes from knowing that through God's power, we can think better thoughts. Wouldn't that be nice? Remember, one of our self-destructive tendencies comes from wrong thinking. Now, verses 5 and 6 talk about this. Read it with me. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's all they're focused on. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. What are you thinking about? Where is your mind and your attention focused? Verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now take, take careful note of this because in God's word, he shows us that we can adopt either one of two mindsets. I hope you saw that. There is a physical mindset based on our old fleshly nature, and there is a spiritual mindset that comes from the spirit of God. Now, our mindset has a huge impact on the way we live. It does. That's why we're constantly in a battle for the mind, because it's important what's going on up here. If you think unstable things in your, your mind and you have a warped way of thinking, it will lead you to destruction. But if you have a balanced mind and, a, and are thinking in a right and healthy way, that will lead to productive life. Now, these are two mindsets that exist, and they're completely different. And you, you'll either have one or the other because you can't have both at the same time. You will either have a mind that is based on the flesh, worldly things, and worldly way of living, or you'll have a mind that is based and centered in the Spirit of God. Now, the Bible says that the mindset of a sinful man is self-destructive. Where did it end? It ends in death. That's what the Bible says. Whereas the mindset of a spiritual man is said to lead to peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's a completely different outcome. Now, I don't know what mindset sounds best to you, but I know what I need in my life. I need a spiritual focus and mindset. And the challenge that you and I have is an ongoing one when it comes to our battle for the mind. We need to have the right mindset. And I want to say... To you today, what you need to do is replace one with the other. Now, the world around you might not change. The trials, the troubles, the problems, the drama you face in your life, that might not change either. But when it comes to your own mental health, change is about the mindset that you choose. Therefore, we need to choose to replace our old mindset with a new one. This is really the lesson we have to learn. In fact, I'd even go so far as to say that whenever you want to change anything in your life, you can't just stand there and resist it. What you need to do is replace it. Okay? This is God's answer to uncontrolled thoughts and thinking. You don't resist 
those thoughts, you replace those thoughts through an entirely new mindset. And this makes sense, doesn't it? The key to breaking any bad mental habits in our lives is not about resistance. It's about replacement. We take bad thoughts, wrong thinking, and we replace it with something that's right. Whatever you simply resist will persist. And do you know why? It's because inevitably you always come back full circle and start focusing on it again. That's why I say we don't resist our mental mindset. We need to replace it with a new one. If I was standing under a tree and it had a massive beehive and a mess of angry bees, I wouldn't just stand there and resist. Okay? I wouldn't sit there thinking, don't get stung, don't get stung, don't get stung. You know what I'd do? I'd walk away. <laughs> so would you. If I'm sitting down and I'm in a situation where I know I ought not to be, I don't sit there thinking, oh, please don't, please don't let this not happen. Oh, oh fingers crossed. You know, What I do is I take myself out of that situation. That's just common sense. This is what we need to do with our own mind and thinking. We need to stop resisting what is wrong and we need to replace that with what is right. Mm. You choose what you focus on. Okay? That's your choice. Now what if when it came to the battle of our minds we just started focusing on the right things? What if our hypercritical, overly negative, poisonous thoughts were somehow replaced with positive, encouraging ways of thinking? What if we redirected our minds to think on healthy things? Do you think that would benefit your mental health? I think it would benefit mine. And it already has. You say, well, pastor, it's just not as easy as that. Well, isn't it? Because as a child of God, the Bible says you have a powerful source within you that can enable new and better thinking. In fact, through the power of the Holy Spirit, our minds can be trained to think in an entirely new way. We can replace our old mindset and completely refocus our thoughts and thinking on new things. What does Philippians 4, verses 7 and 8 say? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your minds through Christ Jesus. So therefore, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That's a whole new mindset. The world conditions us often to see what's wrong. Doesn't it? All we see is our problems, our struggles, all the drama going on. We never see what's right. We've got to replace our natural mindset, that mindset which will lead you to destruction, and we need to replace it with a whole new way of thinking. We need to focus on spiritual things. That's the second key to being free from self-destruction, by the way. It's using the power of God to think better thoughts. Now, the third self-destructive weapon we often picked up comes from our compulsions. Okay? These are the inner drives that often push our lives forward in one direction or another. And when we live our lives purely by compulsion, it can be disastrous. The simple solution God gives us is to say no. <laughs> to say no by the power of his spirit to such compulsions. Okay? And again, notice with me, I did not say no according to our willpower. Okay? We're not resisting, we're replacing. We need to say no through the will and the reality of the spirit within us, not our own willpower alone. Thankfully, as a child of God, we do have the means to say no. It's the power of God that we need to learn to tap into so that we can overcome our sinful nature. Verse 7 explains this. Notice what it says. Because the carnal mind 
is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now that term enmity means to be opposed or to be openly hostile towards. So this is what our sinful tendency in the flesh is. It is all about standing opposed to God. Okay? Our natural mindset is programmed to do the opposite of what God wants us to do. And that can be self-destructive. Therefore, we are not surrendered to God's laws when we are living in our natural mindset. Something needs to change. We need to start saying no to that natural tendency within us. Our challenge, brethren, after we come to know Christ is to say no to the flesh so that we can live in right relationship with God. In Galatians 5 verses 16 and 17 declares this, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Mm. Now again, we have two natures being revealed, don't we? There is our physical nature according to the flesh, and there is our spiritual nature as directed by God. And before we had the Holy Spirit in our life, you know what? Our compulsions were what we answered to. Call them habits, urges, lusts, or impulses. These were the driving force that controlled us all. Before Christ, all we had was willpower alone to stand against such things. But now we have the power of the Holy Spirit to say no. And again, this doesn't mean that you will not have bad desires, only that you no longer have to give in and be controlled by those desires because you have power within you, power of God. Now some might say, well, it seems wrong to suppress our natural tendencies. I mean, why should I uh, look to hold back a desire that comes naturally? That's what some people say. Well, not everything in life that comes naturally is good for you. Okay? I have a lot of natural desires that I ought not to fulfill. Heck, I might have a natural desire to punch someone in the nose, but that doesn't mean I act on it. Someone's obnoxious, you know? That might come naturally to some people. It doesn't make it right. You know, arsenic exists naturally in things found out in the world. It doesn't mean it's healthy for you. In fact, if you ingest that, it'll kill you. A lot of things that exist naturally in the world are indeed poisonous to us. And in this way, a lot of my own natural compulsions are harmful to me. They are destructive in my life. If all of us just did what we naturally felt like doing, none of you would get up and go to work tomorrow. <laughs> so what is beneficial? What is it that is best? What is it that will honor God in our lives? Well, it doesn't come from doing what is natural, what feels natural. Read with me verses 8 and 9. So then... They that are in the flesh, those that are in this natural state, cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. You see, with God, we have the power to say no to the flesh. Now, I want to put to rest a common misconception now, and that is one whereby a lot of people think, that they somehow grow into the Spirit of God, okay? And that, that means that as you mature in the faith, you get more access to God's power. That's not correct. That's not true. That's not how it works. God is a trinity by nature. We know that. And the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you received all of Him, okay? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't happen bit by bit. You have all of God's promises and all of God's power within you right from the start when you accept Jesus Christ. Now, you might not have yet recognized God's full presence or yet fully comprehended how to tap into his power, but that doesn't mean that power's not there. You have all of him. 
You don't get it bit by bit. So the question in our lives is not, do you have all of God? Because you do. His power is within you. The question is, does God have all of you? Are you fully surrendered to his presence and power in your life? Because, brethren, that is how you say no to the flesh. Okay? And this is how God sets us free from our own compulsions. We learn to say no to the flesh according to the power of his spirit within us. Fourth destructive tendency we sometimes take up is fear. God's answer to this is to set our minds on him whenever we're afraid. Okay? It's not resisting, it's replacing. New focus, new attention, new power, right? This stuff is easy when you think about it. It's not really rocket science. This is the fourth solution to the weapons of our own self-destruction, and it's another key to how you can be set free from me, okay? Read me verses uh, 14 through 16 now, Romans chapter 8. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When we get saved... We are adopted into God's family. And God's spirit joins with our spirit to prove that we are his children. And guys, being a child of God in this world affords with it certain privileges. That means something. We have benefits to being in the family of God, which means we don't have to be afraid. Notice, for instance, how we are able to cry out, Abba, Father. <clears throat> that phrase in the Greek really just denotes a childlike term of affection. It's the equivalent of us saying dada or, or papa. Okay, it's, it's one of the most, the first words that, that one of an early child would learn how to say. And this is what we are able to do as the children of God. We are able to call out, to cry out to God in the most basic of ways and he will hear us. When you are afraid... Remember whose family you were in and call out to your father. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of God. I'm indwelled by the spirit of God. And because I'm adopted into the family of God, I know my father will always be there for me. Do you know that? I'm a father. And when push comes to shove, I'd do anything for my children. And it goes beyond just providing for them because I... I would lay my life on the line to protect them if it came down to it. I would. That's just me. And I'm nothing special. So imagine how much more your heavenly Father is prepared to do for you. Because you know what? He already proved his love by sending Jesus to die on the cross for you. The next time you're afraid, remember whose family you're in. And don't be afraid to cry out to your spiritual father because he is there reading, ready and willing to help. What is it that we're really afraid of anyway? Have you ever stopped to think? Some of the most common things people are afraid of in this day and age are fear of public speaking, fear of new social occasions, fear of heights, fear of spiders, etc., etc. These are the things that people are afraid of. And you know what? Our fears are real and they can be destructive in our lives. What about the fear of losing control? See, some of us, we have a need to be in control. We want to control this aspect of our life. We want to be controlled that aspect of our life. And guess what happens when you come to face to face with a set of circumstances that are beyond your control? You're just washed over with fear. What am I going to do? How am I going to cope? What, what's going to get me through this crisis? Well, the Bible says, don't be afraid of such things. Just turn to your heavenly Father and ask for help. You see, fears can claw you know, at our minds. They can affect the way we live. 
And they're so destructive, we have to get a handle on them. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Wow, who would have thought that one of the keys to our mental health comes from our ability to let go of our fears and take up a sound mind? God has not given us a spirit of fear. Where, where do your fears actually come from? They don't come from Him. In fact, the Bible says the more that we're controlled by the Holy Spirit, the less we will be controlled by our fears. God doesn't give you the spirit of fear. That comes from somewhere else. God's Spirit gives you power. God's Spirit gives you love. That's a basic human need. And God's Spirit gives you a sound mind. And this is something we desperately need to get a hold of when it comes to the battle within us all. That battle in our minds. The more Spirit-controlled you are, the less your minds will be controlled by fear. That's a fact. So what do we say to all of this? How do we sum this up? What have we learned so far? Well, hopefully you see that you have a very real tendency to self-destruct. That's a natural state condition that we all have in our flesh. But we're not destined uh, to have ruined lives. In fact, God wants us to experience a greater way to live our lives through him. Now, we often develop wrong thoughts and wrong feelings. And those thoughts and feelings lead to wrong behaviors in our lives. And they can be harmful to us. And some of the greatest weapons we pick up and use against ourselves come from shame, uncontrolled thinking, compulsions, and fear. But God's word enlightens us to a better way. In fact, God's word shows us how we are empowered to overcome those things. And here's how we do it. We remember that we have the power of God within us. We hold to that power to think better thoughts. We replace one old mindset with another. We learn to say no to the flesh, not by our willpower alone, but according to the power of God's Holy Spirit within us. And we turn our thoughts to God whenever we're afraid. Because you know what? God doesn't give you the spirit of fear. He wants to give you a sound mind. Mm. This is the beginning to winning the battle for our minds. These are the mental aptitudes and the basic disciplines that we need to adopt. And you know what? We can do this. We can win the battle and the struggle that is going on within us all because God enlightens us to the path to success. He gives us the spiritual strategy and the weapons that we need to succeed. And they all come by tapping into the power of His Spirit within us. Thank you for your attention this morning. I'll call the worship team forward, and everyone please stand.